Hello, neighbors. Glad you're here today. I also, I want to personally thank you as well uh, for the generosity you showed during our Christmas season. And honestly, we have uh, the most outstanding children's ministry uh, in the city, and it's phenomenal stuff going on down there. And I, yeah, absolutely. Um, our, our children's ministry staff are, um, uh, they're the best I know. And they really are. Uh, they, they love kids, but uh, that space now has become a wonderful spot for kids and, and uh, for, for learning about God. And I hope that if you haven't been down there, check it out and uh, be a part of it. And uh, it's really, really a great space. All righty. Uh, today, we are starting a whole new message series called Won't You Be My Neighbor? And I hope that uh, you will be able to be with us for the next four weekends as we uh, try to figure this out. Uh, we are going for number two. We're not going to go for number one because number one, you know, hey, we don't want to get a big hit. No. Uh, actually, we talk about number one all the time. I'm talking about the commandments. And uh, rarely do we remember about number two. I mean, it's you know, number two kind of gets lost. We don't remember who won the, you know, who, who finished second in the state championship, we, we think about number one. We don't remember who finished second in the Big Ten champ. Oh, yeah, we do. Um, we remember that. But uh, so today is all about uh, talk, taking a look at number two. And, and we're going to take a, a real look at it. We want to take a, a, a reality check, if you want. Now, I know the term reality is not all. I mean, um, reality now is kind of obscure because. Uh, we have these reality TV shows that I don't think have much to do with reality, uh, but they are kind of interesting. I did get to watch Duck Dynasty for the first time, and um, I, I'm impressed. I, I like, wow, I had no idea what all this, you know, and I'm just, I am laughing, and Linda's up in our little office area, and she's trying to work, and she's, what are you watching? And I said, I'm watching Duck Dynasty. You would not believe this. This is awesome. And, and so I'm a, I converted. And, and all, but it's uh, but uh, most of the time in in the reality world, most of the stuff we take a look at, it's 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 kind of a dating thing or a love thing, and uh, and so I want to kind of clear up some stuff about love today. Um, uh, there was a song when I was growing up that went like this: I want to know what love is, and I want you to show me. But rarely does that statement or that song ever get sung to Jesus. We always sing it to somebody else, probably to somebody who doesn't really know much about love. So here we, we have a chance today, I think, to, to, to take a look at uh, love in a, in a new perspective. Matthew 22, 37 through 40, Jesus replied, you must love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment, which is interesting when you think about that. Uh, Love is commanded of those, right, of us, right? It's a command. We typically think that love is a feeling. It's just a, a, you know, kind of a quiver in my liver kind of thing, you know, like, oh, okay. Uh, but my, my favorite group used to sing, it's more than a feeling. It's more than a feeling. Absolutely. So here he says it's, com- we need to, we're commanded, which means, Right? Okay, so this is the first greatest commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commandments. So we're going to spend a little bit more time today because we've oftentimes talked about the first commandment. We're going to talk about the second commandment. And the the first reality of love is that love is a decision. It is a choice. uh, most Most of love that's sung about, talked about today, is not actually about love at all. It's mostly about lust. Uh, we get confused all the time, more and more disappointed about love because what we think is love is not really love. It's just something else. Uh, Dave Reaver, a Vietnam vet, tells us a story about when God spared his life on the battlefield in Vietnam. He had pulled the pin of a grenade and had gone to launch it when it went off in his hand, blowing off his hand and much of the skin on the right side of his face. His entire right side of his face is now deformed. He has no eyelid, badly sunken right jaw, no right ear, no right hand. And in his own words, he would say that his features are grotesque. As he's lying in the hospital bed recovering from his wounds, the man next to him is also recovering to similar wounds. 
The other man's wife walks in, takes one look at her husband, takes off her wedding ring, puts it on the nightstand and says, I can't deal with this at all, and walks out. Dave is sure his wife would do the same thing. But he said, when my wife walked in for the very first time to see me, I said to her, I don't expect you to have to deal with this. She reached down, kissed my burnt lips, and said, you were never that good looking anyway. <laughs> Re Reaver said the reason his marriage survived was that it was not started in the back seat of a car, but it got started on the front pew of a church. 1 John 4, 9 through 11 says, God showed us how much he loved us by sending his one and only son into the world so that we might have eternal life through him. This is real love. I want to know what love is. This is real love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as a sacrifice to take away our sins. We would have no clue that a God of the universe would love us unless he had sent his own son. A sunrise doesn't cut it, right? Or snow in May doesn't clue us in on love, does it? But a death of his son, okay, we begin to get it a little bit. This is real love. And the reality is, is that I'm going to struggle with number two if I don't understand that God loves me. So here the Pharisees have gotten together, the teachers of the law, the lawyers who, who have uh, tried to uh, control the folks with the religion, and, and, and they pose a question to Jesus, and Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? And uh, Clue us in a little bit on your knowledge on this stuff. And Jesus doesn't hesitate, he's not bothered, yeah, maybe he's a little bothered, but he, but he, but he is not flustered by the question, and, and he says, here's, here's what it is. He doesn't hesitate. He just says, well, we've got to love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then we love our neighbors ourselves. Everything else is, you know, without, that, without, without the first two, we're just good neighbors. We're just good neighbors. Because we're not going to lie. We're not going to steal. We're not going to cheat. We're not going to, you know, uh, commit adultery. And we're, we're not, right? We're, we're going to love our, you know, honor our mom and dad, all that kind of stuff. And, and, and honestly, if people do that, we really like them as our neighbor, don't we? We want neighbors like that. We would like neighbors who, you know, would, would, uh, would, would be, be good people. But Jesus doesn't hesitate to this, and he says, here's kind of how it is. You've you got to get these first things first. Bob Benson, the president of Benson Publishing, told the story about when uh, he spoke at his son's graduation ceremony. He was so excited that he had uh, been asked to be a part of this that he went out to buy a new suit, about a three-piece suit. It was, uh, he wanted to look his best for his son's graduation. After the program was over, after he had spoken, uh, a friend of his son's came up to him and says, Mr. Benson, I really appreciate what you, said, what you said today. It was very meaningful. But your vest is a little cockeyed. And Benson looked down, saw his vest. He had, he had not buttoned it correctly. And he said, oh, man, I can't believe I went through the whole thing that way. Uh, I'm embarrassed. I was so careless. And the boy offered this great advice to him. It's really not that hard to do when you get the first button wrong. You ever button your shirt? You get that first button wrong. Like, oh. But when you get the first button right, everything else kind of goes into place. And that's what Jesus says, this whole thing, the whole, all the commandments, get the first button right then the second one's going to work. Otherwise, our life's going to be a little cockeyed from, here, from time to time. But if you get the first button right, it falls into place, Ephesians 1. Even before that he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God's not going to make you love him, but he's going to love you. And he settled his love right on us. And he's directed his love towards you and me. And as a result of embracing the love of God, I think number two is, is possible. Loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Honestly, I think the reason we struggle with loving our neighbor as we love ourselves is some of us don't love ourselves very well. We don't have a very good view of ourselves. And I'm not talking about self-image things, but at the same time, sometimes when we, we look in the mirror, we go, hmm, 
I'm a little disappointed. I mean, look at my life, look how I look, but look at what's going on. And we, we don't really, in fact, maybe it's some stuff we've done in our lives that, that makes us unlovable ourselves. We're, 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 we, we've done some things. We think, well, I can't even, I can't even love our, myself. You know, Whitney Houston said, the greatest love of all is learning to love ourselves, and she was dead wrong with that. That's not the greatest love, learning to love ourselves. The greatest love of all is Jesus Christ dying for my sin. As a result of that, I can finally love myself. When you love God, you have the ability to love yourself and then the strength to love others. It's not always easy to do. There are some people in your life that are difficult to love, to be a good neighbor towards. There, I don't know. Do you have people in your life that just suck it out of you? Like, right? And you see them and you go, oh. They're demanding, negative, selfish people. And I'm not talking just at church. You know, there's, you know, there's people that uh, do that. Romans 15, 7 says, Therefore, accept each other just as Christ has accepted you so that God will be given glory. That's a big deal in our culture today, accepting one another. And I'm not sure we know what that means most of the time. And we're going to spend some time next weekend talking about this, but, but I'm just going to preface it is that there's no doubt that Jesus loves me and accepts me, just like I am right now. And as amazing as that is, it is true that Jesus loves me, just like I am, and accepts me. And the first stop, step of loving my neighbors is to accept them. But, I mean, I don't know what that looks for you, looks like for you. I mean, some of us would think, yeah, but... Uh, they're Muslim. Um, got a real problem with that. Or they're gay. Am I supposed to accept? Or they're, right? And we'll just put whatever category you'd like on there. However it is, I don't know what it looks like for you, but some of us are like, I'm going to struggle loving them because they don't look like me or act like me or think like me or vote like me. 1 John 4, 7 through 8, dear friends, let us continue to love one another, for love comes from God. Anyone who loves is a child of God and knows God, but anyone who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, the, we know this passage. Is, if you've ever gone to a wedding, you know this passage. is always read at a wedding, usually. Uh, here he goes, 1 Corinthians 13, love never gives up. Love cares more for others than for self. Love doesn't want what it doesn't have. Love doesn't strut, doesn't have a swelled head, doesn't force itself on others. Isn't always me first, doesn't fly off the handle, doesn't keep score of the sins of others, doesn't revel when others grovel, takes pleasure in the flowering of truth, puts up with anything, puts up with anything, Trust God always, always looks for the best, never looks back, but keeps going to the end. Love never dies. Inspired speech will be over someday. Praying in tongues will end. Understanding will reach its limit. But love never fails. Love never gives up. You ever want to give up on somebody? I mean, not that you wanted to, but you might have said, well, I'm just so done with you. Go your own way. That's when love stops. Love never gives up. Love always protects, covers over sin. Uh, it doesn't keep score of the sins of others. That little thought there is, is uh, that love covers over sin. I like to think, I don't know if you've watched the Lord of the Rings when Frodo's got this cape and he can throw it over himself and nobody can see him. And that's kind of what I think what love does. It just throws over, you know, that uh, when I look at them, I just need to, not see all that sin stuff and all that kind of stuff. A little boy named Zachary was walking with his dad in the hallway of the church when Zach spotted his buddy Chris. Chris is about 30 years old. When he saw Chris through the window, he noticed that Chris was sitting next to a girl. Dad, 
Chris has a girlfriend. And Zach began chanting, Chris has a girlfriend, Chris has a girlfriend. So his dad used this time to teach Zach a little bit about what might happen if Chris got married. He said, do you know what you would call, what you would call her if they got engaged? And Zach didn't know. And so he said, well, she would be called his fiance. Then he said, what would she be called when they get married? Zach says, why? Oh, that's easy. And his dad thought he was going to say, well, his wife. But he says, no. Uh, he says, I know what she's going to be called. She's going to be called his princess. <laughs> Feelings of royalty just don't happen. When we love someone, right, we treat them like a king or a queen, even if they're my neighbor. Even when they're my neighbor. First John 2.9 it says, if anyone claims I am living in the light or I'm a Christ follower but hates a Christian brother or sister. Now, that's not a strong word, hate. I guess you can figure that out. I, you know, oh, I don't hate him, but I certainly don't. All right. Okay. And what's he say here? That person is living in darkness. As a church... We are never called to be a large church or a mega church. We are just called to be a loving church. I think that when we get our heads and our hearts around just being a loving church, it will be so attractive to people. And I guess, honestly, we'd have to say, well, what are we known for? Uh, would we be known for our love, for our community, for our neighbors, for the people that are around us? Are we making an impact or difference? Are we... Loving our neighbor as we love ourselves. Love starts with treating our family better. Or maybe it starts with our in-laws, our parents. It's a spiritual thing. And this means doing something. It's not just something to say, I love you, I love you. It's so easy to say those words anymore. So easy to say, I love you. And it's almost as if that's just kind of what we say anymore. Love starts with action. E.V. Hill, a great preacher who serves in the inner city of Los Angeles, and this man tells it like it is. As a result, E.V. has had several death threats on his life. A few years ago, somebody had actually telephoned a threat to, to his office and said that E.V. Hill's car would be bombed this next week. One morning he awoke, and to his surprise, his wife was not in bed and had already gotten up, and he called for her, but no response. He checked, and the car was gone, and his heart sank. A few minutes later, she pulled into the driveway. He yelled, woman, what are you doing? She responded, well, I just got to thinking that this community needs you more than it needs me. And if they're going to rig that car to be bombed, I want it to be me, not you. And E.V. Hill said, I always knew that my wife loved me, but now I understand what love is all about. Now, there's a lot of fake and phony things out there about love. The reality is this, that God loves us. He's crazy about us. If God, Max Lucado says, if God had a, had a refrigerator, he'd have your picture on it. Yesterday, we were at a graduation um, a party for my nephew who graduated from Wayne State, and uh, we went into their home, and they've got all these pictures on the refrigerator. I like looking at people's refrigerator. Actually, I kind of like messing with people's pictures on the refrigerator, and so I'm putting stuff on faces and things. Anyway, um, I love the thought that God would have me on his refrigerator. This is the reality about love, that God so loved us. And I think perhaps as we get started with this loving our neighbors, we love ourselves, the first step for many of us might just be, I need to respond to the love of God. That we've never done, and we, we've investigated, we've even thought about it, we've, we've even prayed about it, but we've never really done anything about it. You see, love has to respond. The first step would perhaps be for, for you to say, you know, I want to respond to the love of God and I want to be baptized into Christ. It's a big step. That's doing something. I would encourage you uh, to 
to respond to the love of God that way. I mean, and then kind of think through that. It's like, well, what's um, love? Okay, let's, let's zoom back to the first one. Love God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. What, what's the, what's the, when's the last time I have done something loving towards God? I mean, we're, we're, that involved a sacrifice because, you know, he loved me, so he sacrificed for me. He gave his life for me. I, oh, that's love. That's what, this is what real love is. So I'd have to say, well, when's the last time I sacrificed of my time, my money, my t- energy, my, you know, resources, anything? When's the last time I actually loved God that way? Or, did I, or do I just say, hey, God, I love you? Okay, you you think through that. Now then, then let's go. Okay, when's the last time I actually showed love to my neighbor? My time, maybe my money, my resource, all that kind of stuff. And you know, and, and again, it might just be as simple as you know, I, I don't know what it is for you. Maybe helping around their house, or do, you know, inviting them to a church. There's some way where you sacrifice for them and say, you know, here's what you know. Maybe that one of the best ways you can love your neighbor is to volunteer in our children's ministry so that when they show up for church, we're ready for them. And you think that through. When's the last time I sacrificed? Now, it's interesting to me because he, he summarizes the law here and he says, you know, the, all of these things are wrapped up. And, we're, and I'm trying to think, how do we get our head around that? And he says, but if, if you love yourself, you don't want anybody stealing from you. You wouldn't want anybody... Uh, uh, bearing false witness against you. You don't want anybody having, you know, having adult come in adultery with your wife. You don't want, right? If, if you know, otherwise she's like, oh, hey, whatever, you do whatever you want. No, 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 no. And therefore, if I if if I want people to treat me that way, I don't, right? Uh, I don't want anybody stealing. I don't want anybody, you know, taking my stuff. I don't want anybody taking my wife. I don't want anybody, um, you know, um, all right. Well. Then, then as a result, because I love myself that way, and I love God, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt, right? Okay, I get it. All of the commandments flow out of love. Because I love you, I'm not going to murder you, Right? Because I love you, I'm not going to steal from you. If I, as I love you, I'm not going to right commit adultery with you, right? Because I love you. I love my neighborhood. I love right. Okay, so that's you know reread through the Ten Commandments and view it in the light of love. Because without that, I'm okay. Yeah, I'm a good neighbor. All right, all right. And who doesn't want to live next to a good neighbor? All right. But when we love one another, as Christ loves us, all right, watch out. Watch out. We're going to work on loving our neighborhood next weekend. Hope you'll come here. We're going to get some fun stuff planned, and it will be a really treat for us as a church to mobilize ourselves and begin to love our community in great ways, all right? I hope you'll join us next weekend for that. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for loving us in such a way that we, um, for many of us in this room, have responded to it. For some of us here, we're still thinking through. And uh, I don't know, Lord, uh, I guess my thought would be today is that um, I hope somebody says yes to your love. Quit putting it off. Quit waiting for a better deal. I don't know what they're waiting for. Trying to figure it all out. I just know this. It, you can't figure out love. It makes no sense. What you did on the cross makes no sense. And so instead of trying to figure it all out, to be We just say yes today. Like a in love girl who gets asked 
will you marry me? And she knows she's found the person that she's been looking for. So here today, for some of us, perhaps today would be the day in which we would say yes to your love. Lord, some of us have struggled in this old area of loving our neighbor, accepting our neighbor is so hard. We've got some issues in our lives that have caused us to hold back and And perhaps we would just start today by being honest about it. All right. Do your work right now through your spirit in our lives. In Christ's name, amen.